So as I said, what I'm going to do is cover the technical fundamentals, and I'm going to have to race uh, through these, but you know, you've all seen these words. You've probably, many of you have used these words, or you'll use them in, in your simulation. That's two different things between seeing the words and actually understanding what they mean. And so here's where the crash course comes from. So what are nuclear reactors? It turns out they're actually quite simple. They're water boilers. That's what a nuclear reactor is. They're water boilers. You can boil the water with coal, you can boil it, uh, you can boil it with gas, or you can boil it uh, with a neutron reaction. So if you have nuclear fuel down here in this nuclear core, and if you split the nuclei, it turns out, as I told you, factor of millions creates lots <coughs> of heat. A and if you have a system where that heat can then go ahead and heat water, and the water can boil into steam, then the steam can drive a turbine and you can make electricity. So this part looks just like any other power plant, but instead of burning coal you know, through uh, the combustion uh, of your fuel, you burn the nuclear fuel by neutron reactions of fissioning uh, that <coughs> material. Uh, and it turns out, in order to make them work right, these neutrons, when you fission, when they're created, they're very fast. Uh, you have to slow them down in order to do more fissioning, and I'll show you what a chain reaction looks like. To slow them down, then one uses water. And what light means in light water reactor is normal water. So if you use normal water in here to slow down the neutrons and to cool and extract the heat, that's called a light water reactor. Boiling water just means the mechanical aspects <laughs> of taking the steam straight from uh, this combination in, in the pressure uh, vessel. So that's what a light water reactor is. You boil water, you make electricity. It's that simple. So where do you get these nuclear materials from? Now, those of you, I hope all of you have taken enough science courses to see the periodic table. And it turns out, so actually one of the good things is this splitting of the nuclei. You can't just split any of these elements. It's much too hard up here. These are easy to fuse, and that's why this thing is called the hydrogen bomb, when you fuse the nuclei. To split them, you have to come way down here into this last table of the, of the periodic table, the, the last row, called the actinides. And uranium is the heaviest known natural element. That's the fuel that you typically use for nuclear reactors. And it turns out that there are different isotopes. Isotope, uh, what isotope means is you have a certain number of protons and, e and electrons. You have to have the same amount, plus and, and minus. Uh, and then you have neutrons, and you just add in extra neutrons, and so you get different isotopes. So uranium that you dig out of the ground today, uranium ore, is mostly composed of the isotope 238. That's the atomic mass, number of neutrons and protons. In fact, 99.3% of that uranium that you dig out is this 238, and it turns out it doesn't fission, it doesn't split easily. So that's the uranium you're not too concerned about. However, the other 7 tenths of percent is this uranium-235. That's the fissile isotope of uranium. That splits easily. Uh, and so that's the stuff inside of the reactor that will split, create the heat so that you can boil the water. However, if, as it turns out, if you also have 238 present and you have it in the reactor, if 238 picks up a neutron, then it actually turns into plutonium-239. And that plutonium is here, uh, element number 44. And the best isotope uh, for both reactors and bombs is, is plutonium-239. So these are the two principal elements, uranium-plutonium, that you feed into a reactor to make heat, or that you can feed into bombs in order to split uh, and, uh, and make an explosive. It turns out a third is uranium-233, but that's another course that's associated with using thorium uh, for nuclear reactors, which really isn't done commercially today, <laughs> but could be done. Okay, now here's just a little cartoon. So the little green thing is a neutron. So you generate a neutron, or you catch a stray neutron, 235, the stuff that splits, turns into 236, the 235 is already sitting up there sort of nervous and unstable, but once you turn it into 236, that's really unstable, and it's sitting there sort of vibrating like a liquid drop, 
and then it finally comes apart. And as you see, it splits into two different elements, you know, two different chemical elements, in this particular case, krypton and, and barium, and then most importantly, two neutrons. You have one neutron coming in, split the nucleus into two different elements, those are called the fission products, and it makes two neutrons. Now you can imagine if you put one neutron in and you get two out, and then you repeat that in a lattice or a material that has lots of <coughs> uranium-235, you see what you get? A chain reaction. One goes to two, two goes to four, and it just keeps going. So that's the nature of creating nuclear energy. So that's how you make a chain reaction. Difference between a reactor and a bomb is in a reactor, you want to control it. You don't want this <coughs> thing to blow up. In a bomb, you want to control it also, but in such a way that you actually concentrate that energy and then it finally just blows up. So that's the difference. And so here's then the difference between a reactor uh, and a bomb. Oops. So the, the reactor is on the right-hand side. Uh, and as I'd already indicated before in the cartoon, uh, you have this. This is the core. And these are the fuel elements. And in this case, so a fuel element is simply a long stack of uranium oxide pellets that are stacked one on top of the other inside of a metal cladding, and you stack a bunch of these metal claddings together uh, inside this reactor. Now you can see that has lots of surface area. You have water going in there in order to take that energy, that heat, and then go ahead and make steam. But since there's lots of surface area, the neutrons are coming out in all directions, uh, and to control them, just like you use the damper in a fireplace to cut the oxygen down, if the flames gets too big, in this case, you shove in what are called control rods. And, and this is just like turning the damper. What they do, the control rods, they suck up neutrons. They're made of materials that like neutrons and just capture the neutrons. So now you've captured the neutrons. They can't go multiply, so you're controlling the chain reaction. If you've watched th uh, the cartoon on the left, it's exactly the opposite. You take the fissile materials, in this case, let's say it's highly enriched uranium that is concentrated in 235, uh, or plutonium. You put it in the middle. Now you want to push it together really fast. You put high explosive around it. That's the red stuff going off. You can see it shrinks that little ball of plutonium. The neutrons have got no place to go. And then all of a sudden, that explosive chain reaction takes off and it blows up. So it turns out you cannot make a bomb out of a reactor. You can have an accident like Fukushima. You can have a hydrogen explosion. That is, the hydrogen burns and you know, blows up. But it's not a nuclear explosion. It puts radioactive materials around, but you don't get a mushroom cloud. So I told you, you can't, you can't get a mushroom cloud out of a reactor uh, because the reactor is different than the bomb. However, the materials that go into the reactor or go into the bomb are very, very similar. And the methods of making those materials are essentially identical. And right after the Manhattan Project uh, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, this uh, H. and Lilienthal report uh, that was guided by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the first director at Los Alamos, uh, they said, look, this factor of millions is strictly an incentive that's overwhelming. The countries that fear, you know, for their security, they're going to build a bomb. The incentive is overwhelming. And then the problem is the technologies for the bomb or for peaceful use are essentially interchangeable and interdependent. Okay, so here's the fuel cycle. Uh, and in essence, uh, what that means is the following. Uh, you start out by mining the uranium, uh, you t and you mill it. You turn it into a uranium oxide. And that is, you've <coughs> purified it somewhat, gotten rid of all the other junk uh, that you pick up in mining. Uh, and this is the stuff that's typically called yellow cake, uranium-3, oxygen-8. So you take this yellow cake, you convert it into a form of uranium that either allows you to enrich it or allows you to make fuel. Uh, that is natural uranium fuel. Uh, that would be 99.3 uranium-238. You have to use a metallic fuel uh, if you're going to use natural. If you want a commercial reactor, what you typically do then 
is convert this to what's called uranium hexafluoride. You take that and you put it into an enrichment facility, like a centrifuge facility I'll mention in a minute, uh, that allows you to enrich. Enrich meaning taking the natural level of 0.7%, 235, throwing away a lot of the 238, and getting it up to 3 to 5%. That's what you use for a light water reactor. From that, you go ahead and you make your fuel. As I mentioned, this would be typically uranium oxide pellet. This would be a bundle of fuel <coughs> elements that you put in the reactor. You put it in a power plant, you make electricity. Okay, so that's the civilian nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, up to here you make electricity. If you take it from here, then you can take the spent fuel because after a while that fuel poisons itself. So you have to take it back out of the reactor. And if you just store it, that's spent fuel storage. Or if you want to extract the uranium that's still in there that's usable, or the plutonium that's built up, then you do the reprocessing. That's what France does. France goes this way, comes all the way around, makes electricity, takes the uranium plutonium back out, and recycles it right back into fuel fabrication. That's co called the closed civilian fuel cycle. The US goes this way, goes, goes ahead, makes the electricity, and stores the spent fuel. And we haven't quite yet figured out how to get the populace to accept that spent fuel anywhere. We tried it in Nevada, and the Nevadans didn't want it. Uh, so at this point, spent fuel is sitting uh, at the reactor location. Okay, so that's the civilian fuel cycle. The problem is that this same fuel cycle can be used to make bomb fuel now rather uh, than reactor fuel. The way you can do that, if you want highly enriched uranium, you go up here and you enrich, but instead of stopping at three to five percent, you just keep going to 90% and that's bomb fuel, good bomb fuel. Or you can take it all the way around this way, reprocess, take that plutonium out and use it for a bomb. And so the centrifuges then, essentially what centrifuges are, uh, is the cartoon over here, uh, and that is you turn your uranium into a gas. The gas is then fed into a centrifuge that spins very, very, very fast like 100,000 RPM, you know, so really fast. And the way you separate the 238, the heavy stuff, from the light stuff is strictly the mass difference. 238 goes to the outside, 235 to the inside. You scoop it off, and each one of these centrifuges does it, and you just set up cascades of this, get a little enrichment, a little more, feed it down a little more, a little, a little more, and you go either stop at 3, .5, 3 to 5%, or, as I'll show you, for a reactor fuel at 20%, you've heard that number, it's actually 19.75, by the way, uh, percent. Uh, that uh, can be used for research reactors. Or, same equipment, just different, little different configuration, you keep going to bomb fuel. That's what we're concerned about when countries have an enrichment plan. They say they're making reactor fuel, but they have the capacity to make bomb fuel. For reactors, as I just mentioned to you, particularly these reactors that use natural uranium fuel, uh, and particularly that use graphite to slow down the neutrons instead of light water, or they use heavy water to slow down the neutrons. Heavy water means you use an isotope of hydrogen, namely deuterium, so instead of H2O, it's D2O. Uh, and it turns out these reactors make very good uh, bomb grade Uranium, uh, plutonium. And that's what the North Koreans have done. They said, you know, we built these reactors. By the way, this is actually one of my photos from one of my trips. It's the best photo anywhere on the web that you can find. I happened to be there and they allowed me to take it and the sky was blue. It was beautiful. So uh, this reactor, they said, was for making electricity. <laughs> and it turns out it makes five megawatts of electricity, which isn't very much but it makes one bomb's worth of plutonium a year. So again, there's the dual nature. You know, North Koreans said it was for electricity, and we said, yes, we know that, but what are you gonna do with the plutonium? Well, if you just leave the plutonium in a spent fuel, it doesn't do you much good. You have to extract it. That's the process that's called reprocessing. And you do that in a chemical facility. It turns out, unlike uranium, separating uranium-235 from 238, same chemistry, but 
different mass. In this case, plutonium uranium, different chemistry. So you can use chemical techniques uh, to reprocess and extract the plutonium and then use the plutonium uh, as bomb fuel. Turns out if you run a light water reactor to make commercial electricity, uh, it also makes plutonium, but it's not the good bomb grade plutonium, although you can certainly uh, make it. Okay, now, so that's the fuel. But what does it take to actually feel the bomb? Well, you have to have the fuel. No fuel, no bomb, right? So the fuel, I just told you the whole cycle. And that's the hardest part, because it's not easy to build these centrifuges. That's pretty high tech. It's not easy to just build a reactor. Uh, you have to learn how to do that. Uh, but that's the material. Then once you have the material, then you have to build a bomb. That's what weaponization is. Weaponization is building the bomb. You have to understand the physics. I explained to you in that imploding system, for example. You gotta make sure you understand how many neutrons escape, how many neutrons you gotta try to capture, and how many neutrons actually get generated. How you generate it fast enough that it will actually blow up. And then if you use a system that uses a, a explosives to compress a ball of plutonium, or highly enriched uranium, you have to understand the physics uh, of the explosion. You gotta understand how to build the lenses. Again, all of that is not easy. You gotta deal with explosive detonators, initiators. You know, I showed you that cartoon of one stray neutron. Well, in this case, for a bomb, you don't want a stray neutron, you actually want to inject the neutron. And you can make neutrons, it turns out it's easy enough. So you have to know how to do that. You got a machine, assemble, uh, and if you're gonna do these implosion devices, you have to practice that somewhere. So you gotta do explosive testing with inert materials to figure out how you get these things. You can just imagine if you're exploding, uh, uh, imploding, you know, a sphere, and you start to implode and your lenses are explosive aren't quite right and it squirts out. No mushroom cloud. It has to come all the way in. And of course, why are bombs round? Because you lose fewer neutrons because surface area per volume is the least. And then, suppose you make the bomb, then you have to deliver it. Uh, of course, really crude, uh, a truck, van, plane, boat, and indeed, uh, B-29 delivered Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The one that's of greatest concern, of course, are the missiles. But then you have to miniaturize. You gotta make it small to fit on the missile. Missile goes out, missile has to come back in. Lots of thermal stress, lots of mechanical stress, not easy. But the bottom line is, this is difficult, but not impossible for a determined nation. Okay, then these are essentially the two types of bombs. So when you hear the terminology gun assembly, implosion device, <coughs> that's what they mean. The simplest bomb, and this was the Hiroshima bomb, uh, you just take two halves uh, of uh, highly enriched uranium, you put them in a gun barrel and you fire them together. And all those conditions that I talked about happen and it blows up Hiroshima, 13 kilotons, 13,000 tons of high explosive. And, and all you needed was some number of tens of kilograms. Hiroshima actually was more like 60 kilograms uh, of 80% enriched uh, uranium. Plutonium, they found out during Manhattan Project, uh, it, uh, that gun the gun assembly is too slow. There are nuclear reactions that happen that just make it fizzle. So you have to do it faster. You do that with high explosives, the way that cartoon showed you. If you use plutonium, less than 10 kilograms. You know, even Nagasaki was a grapefruit. That's it. One grapefruit of plutonium, six kilograms, destroyed the entire city uh, by uh, the implosion. So the, uh, the, however, the plutonium was six kilograms. The bomb you know, was about this big, 10,000 pounds. Uh, and it was delivered on a B-29. Okay, so now I'm gonna go from, uh, that's it for the technical primer.